it's nice to be here. And first of all, Mary Wells, I got to tell you something. I know, I'm not the singer. <laughs> Your name brought back memories. <laughs> not a bad hearing, though. <laughs> Trivia question. I grew up in Detroit. Anybody ever been to Detroit here? You got back alive, that's good. <laughs> because Detroit is my hometown, and I grew up on Motown. And the first singer in the history of Motown to have a number one hit was Mary Wells. And it was called, You Beat Me to the Punch. You hear that song? You well, beat me to heart. the punch. No. Nobody ever heard that song? It was written by Smokey Robinson. And produced by Smokey Robinson, my favorite singer. I'm old school. But anyway, before I get started, it's called Welcome to the Spider's Web with Spider Jones. That's me, of course. That's not my real name. Uh, and I'll tell you about that in a minute, but it's called What I've Learned from Champions of Life, because I've had the privilege of interviewing so many of them. But I want to share a secret with you first. Can you keep a secret? Uh, Principal, can you keep a secret? I graduated from Cash Tech in Detroit, Michigan, grade 13, and I'm the only one in the history of, that, of Michigan State that graduated with 100%. What do you think of that? <laughs> Twenty-five in English, twenty-five in literature, and twenty-five in engineering. <laughs> of course, that's true. One of the things I've had the privilege of talking to these these young people, uh, students in front of me, and um, I asked a few questions. I thought one of the things that I I don't have a lot of time today, and, and uh, I think we got was seventeen minutes. And that's a pretty short time for a guy, especially with a father who was a black Baptist minister. That's uh, real long-winded. My father used to, uh, was, a, was a pastor. You know what a pastor is, right? Most of you know what a pastor is. Do you know what a pastor is, my friend? It's not where the horses go. He's talking about the pastor with the, uh, he's, a, he's a minister. My father was a Southern Baptist minister. And he liked to pray a lot. And I remember every Sunday, because there was 13 kids in our family, we had this big long table, and my mother and my sisters would prepare the dinner. Uh, I, uh, you know, the dinner every Sunday we'd have uh, some guests over, and I remember just before we, we, we'd sit down to eat, my father would, would begin to pray. He loved to pray, and he'd be praying, and, and then the steam would, would, would suddenly turn to ice. The mashed potatoes would go colder than a mother-in-law's heart. I'm joking. <laughs> my mother-in-law, a good woman. God bless if possible. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so when I get 15, 20 minutes, I'm so sure I usually like, when I speak to young people, it's usually for about 45 minutes. But I want to share something with you. How many here have a dream, first of all? How many really have an aspiration, a dream? Raise your hands. And be proud. Raise them up over your head. You've already fulfilled your dream, but you want to go to space. You want to go to space. You want to beat these young people. I heard you talking to these young You want to beat them to space. And this is their generation. I'm a little envious, actually. Why I asked you if you had a dream is because I had a dream. My dream began when I was 10 years old. I knew what I wanted to be at 10 years old. Many children don't. I work in a lot of schools, and a lot of kids, what do you want to be? Oh, I want to be in the NBA. I want to be a hockey player. I want to be a fashion designer. I want to be a rapper. They want to be, they want to be all the things that they see on television. And yet they have their own gifts, their own creative spirit inside. But then they, they become clones because they want to be like, let's just say Beyonce or, 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 or someone else up there, Bruno Mars, you know? You know, he can dance. I like Bruno. <laughs> Oh yeah, don't laugh at me. I may be old, but I got more moves than the Jackson family. And I'm going to tell you something. I was 10 years old. I went to a place called the Fox Theater in Detroit. It's a big, beautiful place, and every Saturday they would hold a talent, not a talent night, but a teen night, a teen evening, for the kids to come in. They come off every major hood in Detroit. And that was at a time when Detroit was known as the murder capital of the world. But that's another story. I can't share that with you. But I came from that, the projects, from nothing. I lost a brother. He was murdered in Detroit. That's not inspiring, but I'm, I'm trying to tell you where I came from to be what I, what I, I became. And a lot of these people I'm going to show you in a second. But we went to the Fox Theater that afternoon. And I saw this man come out on stage. 
Now, you probably never heard of him, but go to YouTube and look up a guy named Alan Freed. F-R-E-E-D. Alan Freed was the number one disc jockey in North America back in the 50s and 60s. He coined the phrase, rock and roll. And he got that phrase because he brought together white kids and black kids. He brought together race music, which was soul music, and pop rock music, which was white music. He put it together and he said, rock and roll. And they asked him what that meant. He said, that means everybody's music. And he brought the kids together. Black, white kids, Latino kids, Asian. He brought them all together. That's something the United States had never seen. And when I saw him come on that stage in that thunderous applause, and he waved at the crowd, and he was throw, showing love up to all the kids in the nosebleed territory. You know, hey, how you doing? And everybody loved it. Then he began to introduce all these great acts. And it hit me like a Mike Tyson left hook. I want to be a radio broadcaster. I knew then and there, when I was walking home after, up Woodward Avenue with my cousins and these other dudes that I knew, and I, I, I was bragging about it, boasting, I'm going to be a radio. They stopped me in my tracks. And my cousin Sonny put his arm around me and said, man, you talk like a damn fool. That's what he said. Ain't no black people in radio. And that's all I ever heard. Yet here was this dream in, in my heart, in my soul. I love music so much it became my opium. I don't need to get high off drugs or booze. I just, music, when I get stressed today, I turn it on, everything. And man, I just groove, get that vibe going. But my cousin and his friends, they were part of a crew. They are part of a gang. I didn't know when I was 10 years old, I don't know what a gang was. But I know one thing, I listened to all these naysayers. How many have had their dreams laughed at? Put your hand up. There you go. You see? Because people that have no dream have no vision. How can they see your dream? But check this out. You don't need their approval. You need your own. How old do you think I was when I got my first job in radio? Young lady, how old do you think I was when I got my first job in radio, my first gig? <laughs> Why do you offend me like that? <laughs> you think I'm that stupid? Well, you're absolutely right, I'm 40. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, listen, that's 30 years. Hey, I had that dream when I was 10 years old. 30 years, Why do you th what was the biggest reason that it took me so long to bring that dream into reality? Who's going to answer that question? Go ahead. Boxing career? Excuse me? Is it boxing career? No, my boxing career, they used to call me Kid Candle. A great name, made one blow and I was out. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think it took me so long? Yes, sir. You didn't believe in yourself? That's right. One reason, I had no self-worth. you got to believe you can do it. But there's another reason, too. I had no game plan. Get a game plan. Third reason, I hung around with people that were negative. They didn't believe in us. And I got sucked in on them. But one day I woke up. And I went back to school. At 30-something years old. Because this time I decided, without an education, without a diploma, I got nothing. I went back to school because my wife talked me into it. And she said, you go back to school, you got to bring that dream into reality. That's, you want to be a broadcaster. Never in my life, when I was your age, if somebody told me that I would have my own radio show and I would go coast to coast like buttered toast, I would have thought they were crazy. If somebody told me that I would interview the greatest basketball player of all time, I would have said, you're out of your mind. If somebody told me I would be, become close friends with the greatest boxer of our time, I would have said you are nuts because I had no self-worth and I didn't believe in myself. If somebody told me that I would write a book, one day it would be a number one seller, I would have said you're out of your mind. Here I am. I'm 73 right now. And I'm going to tell you what, as long as I'm living, I'm going to keep giving. And as long as I'm breathing, I'm going to keep believing. I just finished my second book. So think what you can do with your energy. My father used to say to me, when I would boast about I was going to do this and that, you know what he used to say to me? Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. You know what he meant by that? What does he mean by that? Come on. What do you say? No one wants to sacrifice. There, we're right on. I like that. you got to be willing to sacrifice. And if you don't know what you're doing, ask somebody that does. Don't give up on yourself.
Let's give Rich an ugly face, geez. Champions who have inspired me because they beat the odds was start with Muhammad Ali. When he fought for the title, the first and the third time, he was a huge underdog. All the experts says he was finished. He would never do it. But he fooled everybody. In 1966, when I got out of prison, I lived at Sully's gym. He came to town to fight Muhammad Ali. I left with him. I learned so much from this man. He was passionate. He was compassionate. He gave so much. And this man had a heart of gold. And believe me, he wasn't just a pretty face. This dude could fight. And he always had a game plan. Every fight he had, he had a game plan. How much time do I have here? What do I go to? I got what? Eight more minutes. <laughs> time is on my side. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> so this guy had so much. He gave me so much. And I remember the first time I boxed him, I was, the gym was jammed up. He was going to fight George Chappelle. The place was jammed up. Cameras all over the place. He called me in the ring. I went in with him. And I thought for sure. I knew I was going to get my butt kicked. This was a champion of the world. I was a Golden Glove champion. I was 190 pounds. This guy was, was 215. He was faster than lightning. In fact, he was so fast. He could walk in his bedroom, flick off the light, and get in bed before the room was dark. And that's how fast Muhammad Ali was. But he took me away with him. I learned so much from him. And I'm proud to say to this day, this picture was taken in New York where I hosted an event. He was at. And he had so much of an impact on me. You gotta have that kind of passion. Bill Clinton, well, I did a job with Bill Clinton. I spoke at a place he was at. I opened up for him. And we were in the dark room for about an hour together talking. And I learned a lot from him. He's a wonderful speaker, I tell you. He knows how to inspire people. But I how was here's this kid from the projects with nothing? Failed grade three and grade four and was told I couldn't make it. I got to meet Bill Clinton and interview him. Mark Wahlberg, I just did a couple things with Marky Mark. Anybody know who Marky Mark is? <laughs> and he, he helped my organization. I have an organization called Belief to Achieve. We have a youth center, uh, the Jane uh, Wilson area. And uh, Mark uh, uh, contributed a lot of money. And you know what? He didn't even ask to be, a, uh, to be, uh, you know, be acknowledged for it. But youngest of nine children, this guy come from, uh, they come from poverty, South Boston. I mean, come from poverty. This guy went back, this guy went to jail at 17 years old. And he gives back now. And when he first broke into the, in, into uh, uh, movies, he was a laughing stock. Nobody thought he had what it took. He proved them wrong. I always bring Oprah because Oprah grew up poor. I'm talking, she grew up in Mississippi, poverty with nothing. She went to, she went to, uh, uh, to, to um, Chicago and they told her she didn't have a face for television. They basically told her, you ain't going to make it in television. A couple years later, she dethroned the king of daytime television. His name was Phil Donald W. She, she wasted him. This woman, is, and she gives so much back. Now, I don't listen to her all the time. She's not. It's not my, that's a woman's show. My wife really likes her. I respect, no, I'm, hey, listen, I'm not a chauvinist, but I don't wear nylons and stuff, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I respect her. She's a great example for all women. Anybody ever see CSI? Okay, 15 years ago, and I've interviewed this man three or four times. Daniel, you know something, Anthony Zucker? 10 years ago, 11 years ago, he was working for eight bucks an hour at the MGM uh, hotel. He was a baggage handler. That's all he did, eight fifty an hour. And one day he began to watch this program with his wife. And he said, you know what? This is interesting, forensic science, how they can solve a murder. But it wasn't, he wanted something in drama. He decided, that idea popped into his head. Everybody in this room gets ideas. Are you gonna follow them through? Or are you going to say, I can't do it? He had no connections. He didn't even know how to write a script. He knew nothing about forensic science. He studied, sacrificed a little bit, went to Hollywood. They closed doors on him, went back a second time. They took, today he's a multimillionaire. Got a, a, a big time book out. And CSI's the most watched program in history. Smokey Robinson, my hero, grew up, grew up in Detroit just down the street from me. I had an interview, interviewed him four or five times. 
He wrote Motown's biggest number one hits, My Girl, My Guy, and all kinds of other stuff. He was the big inspiration of Michael Jackson, Prince, and Bruno and all. This is the man, believe me. So there you go. Russell Peters, I just stayed at his house a month ago. Russell Peters opened up for me 10 years ago. First time he went on stage, he was booed off the stage. He didn't cry, he didn't, he didn't whine. He critiqued, went back a month later and had a standing ovation. Now he made $13 million last year and, and had his driver drive me all over the place. These are people, he come from Brampton. He come from nothing. He made something himself because he believed he could do it. I always say Frankie Valley, anybody hear the Jersey voice? That was the inspiration, Frankie Valley. I had the honor of meeting him. You know what? It was a big deal. This guy that sang that song, Sherry, remember? Walk like a man, fast as you can. Walk like a lad with me. <laughs> that was him. So I'll leave you with that. Dr. Ben Carson, I mean, this guy was a neurosurgeon, one of the greats. I'm glad he left politics. He's, he's not good at it. But he's a great <laughs> surgeon. He walked up and down the street for me. Got two minutes left. Okay, thank you. <laughs> but look at him. He made medical history by becoming the first surgeon to successfully separate co-joined twins joined at the back of their heads. Led a 70-member team in a 22-hour operation. The man's a brilliant surgeon. He was born to a woman when she was 13 years old. Her husband left her. And in grade 5, he was voted the dumbest kid in the class. That's, kids can be mean. But his mother believed in him. And she made him learn how to read and go to school. And his brother's an engineer, but an architect. That's why I put him up there. I interviewed him many times. They all had a vision. You got to see it before you can be it, right? When you get a vision of what you want, they all had self-confidence. When you achieve, you begin to believe, and when you believe, you begin to achieve. But you have to achieve. Stay set on your goals. Boom. They all had a game plan, and they all had dedication. That's my, that's, that's all I can share with you today. My time is up. You're, you're a wonderful bunch of young people, and I love you, and I want to see you do well. Stay focused on your dream. Hang around people that inspire you. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your day.